Radio, hosted by Samantha Scarlett and her co-host, Caitlin Mora. Paranormal, metaphysical, conspiracies, rock and roll, and beyond. Hi, this is Samantha Scarlett, and today on Area 666 Radio, broadcasting from an underground location near New York City, my co-host, Caitlin. Caitlin! Hi! Who's joining us via the phone, and I will be interviewing Isis Aquarian of the Source family. If you're not familiar with the Soros family, they were a hippie cult in the 1960s and 70s in Los Angeles who kind of single-handedly started the vegan food movement. They also were into sex magic and had celebrity followers. So we'll get talking with Isis Aquarian after our first song of the day, which is in her honor, the song The Age of Aquarius by The Fifth Dimension. joined by Charlene Peters, a.k.a. Isis Aquarius of the Source family. Hi, Charlene. Hi, you guys. Hi. So we're really excited yeah. to have you on. Caitlin and I, as we were saying before we started rolling, are both really big fans of the documentary on the Source family and just of, like, the whole vibe of the Source family. And so it's an honor to get to have you on our show. So starting off, you were one of Father Yod, a.k.a. birth name Jim Baker's 14 wives in the Source family. Prior to that, you seemed to be a bit of a socialite. How did you come to join the Source family and find out about them? Um, well, I had a very famous full life happening uh, with one of the most famous rock and roll photographers at the time, Ron Raffelli. And we were running his studio, and we needed... Uh, some pictures for Jesus shoot for uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, oh, and I had, so. yeah, I had known Jim Baker when he had the Old World Restaurant, so I knew him. I knew his wife at the time, Dora, okay. but I had lo lost touch with him, and I heard that he, had, you know, morphed into uh, running the Source Restaurant, a vegetarian restaurant, and everybody was running around with long hair and robes and looking like Jesus, so. I said, I'm going to go down to the source. I'm going to get us some models. And I'm going to say hi to my old friend, Jim Baker. So I went down to the source. And as soon as I stepped on the patio and he came out, it was, he wasn't Jim Baker anymore. I mean, he was, but he wasn't. He looked like Moses. And um, it's just, it was, it was like, you know, when they talk about a rapture, <laughs> Or, or, like me or a, yeah, or an uncoding, or just that something cosmically happens that you can't explain, and that's it. It, it was that's a soul to soul. It was a soul to soul imprinting and bonding, and I went, you know, oh my God, um, this is it. I'm never going. This is what I have been waiting for on my spiritual journey, and I instantly. I instantly knew that I had made these commitments before incarnating to this person to help him do the work once again. And I just, I never looked back. No, no. And to this day, I haven't. Now, not to cut you off, but can you tell us a little bit about Father Yod's life prior to becoming Father Yod when he was Jim Baker? Jim, yeah, Jim Baker was known as a food guru. He was, he was a Hollywood legend to begin with. Oh, yeah. He, he, Oh yeah, he well he was a legend before he even came to Hollywood. Um, he, he he became a war hero. He saved the USS Chicago. Well, he didn't save the, the ship, but it was burning. But he saved the men by shooting down thirteen Japanese planes oh while the men were in the water and there was their fire everywhere. And so he he had a whole thing before he even hit Hollywood, and he hit Hollywood, and he went out for the role of Tarzan, and so he just, that was, you know, that's just, was Jim Baker, he was, Jim Baker was always ahead of his time, he was always even two steps ahead of himself, and that's the only way I can explain him, uh, he would part energy as he would walk, you know, so 
he hit Hollywood and he just uh, uh, he just got in with the mover and shakers of the time and with his famous restaurant you were in in the old world and uh, then when he opened up the source it was the same thing you know everybody just went he was friends with like Steve Allen Warren Beatty Greta Garbo was his first customer at the Aquarian, so he he was yeah he was already a Hollywood legend. He he was what I call the ultimate animal man. And then when he morphed over into the source, I'm just going to talk my language. You might not understand. <laughs> no, I, I understand. It's awesome. Like, okay. I'm enjoying I it. <laughs> I can't talk any other way. But um, <laughs> so when he uh, started the source and really started his spiritual path in earnest, because he had just been with the Yogi Bhajan, and um, started right away documenting things. And the baby had the cord wrapped around its neck three times, and the baby was not breathing. And Father said, he put a plea out to God, and he said, Dear God, if you let this baby live, I will never speak anything but the word of God. And he bent down, and he breathed into him, and the baby came alive. And then he pulled out of his pocket his name. So, I mean, he knew who that, that baby was before it was even born. He knew it was going to be a male, and he had its name already. Oh and there was other miracles, but he said, this isn't the time for miracles. He said, that's not what this with this that, time is about. With that baby, um, did that baby went on to live a normal life? Oh, yeah. Solomon's just a great, healthy a uh, grown man with two oh, wow. ch children of his own now. That's so amazing. That's so amazing. Now, wow. aside from performing miracles, Father Yod was also a practitioner of sex magic. Can you tell us about that? And was it based off of Alistair Crawley's doctrine of sex magic, or was it something else? No, um, Alistair Crawley took the mystery school teachings of Tantra, sexual practice, and he kind of got into the dark side with it. You know, any magic, any teaching can be taken to the dark or the light. This depends on how you use it and where you yourself go, go with it. What we did is we took everything and we made it sacred. Our sex was tantric. Do you know what tantric is? Yes. Um, for people that yes. aren't aware, it has to do with, isn't it like orgasm control and drawing things out? But it's also a, I think I want to say it's a, some Middle Eastern, is it Middle Eastern or Buddhist? No. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's Indian, it's Kama Sutra. It's basically, it, it, it's not a lust, a lust energy. The man actually does not lose his seed. He pulls it up his spine and it becomes an, a Kundalini experience. So, yeah, so we had, you know, we didn't have orgies and um, it was a very sacred thing among us. And the sexual practice with the mystery school teachings is an energy to aid one to elevate themselves to a higher state of being if it's used right. Even the, the herb that we used, which was the marijuana, we called it the sacred herb, and it was only used in the morning for meditation for spiritual purposes. One hit a day, and that was it. And our music was sacred. Our music was spontaneous. And... Um, that's just the way we that's the way we lived our life. Now you mentioned marijuana. Was there usage of anything else like psychedelics? No. Yeah. No. Although most of us who came in had, you know, absolutely were, you know, came in probably using every known psychedelic there was. <laughs> How did um, Father Yod develop his mystical doctrines? Did he come up with these on his own, or did he do study? Them. He was well versed in spirituality before he even started the source. Are we clear? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he was a Vedanta monk for six months. He investigated the Quran. He knew the Kabbalah, and I mean very well. He knew it, investigated it, lived it, studied it. American Indians, Egyptians, you name it. He went through it. And then so he brought the family through it. And we got to experience all of that. And then things started when you're in a spiritual frequency. Then he actually started channeling. We didn't know what that was then. But 
he started bringing in information in morning meditation. So we got new information, spiritual information. And we just formulated our, our life as things progressed, we progressed with it. Um, the Source family was funded, I believe, through their vegan restaurants, which you mentioned earlier. Is it true that Father Yon and the, the whole family are kind of like the founders of the vegan movement? Well, we were we were vegan, but then we, we were vegetarian because, you know, he when he, he founded the Source restaurant on the unknown teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and things were raw, and I guess it was pretty vegan, and it wasn't really doing that well. So he had to, uh, you know, put in cooked food and other things. But we were vegetarian. But yes, we were. We were the found. Uh, he was the founders of that with the source restaurant. Archive keeper. I just started right away documenting things. And the baby had the cord wrapped around its neck three times, and the baby was not breathing. And father said, he put a plea out to God, and he said, "Dear God, if you let this baby live." I will never speak anything but the word of God. And he bent down and he breathed into him and the baby came alive. And then he pulled out of his pocket his name. So, I mean, he knew who that, that baby was before it was even born. He knew it was going to be a male and he had its name already. Oh my God. And there was other miracles, but he said, this isn't the time for miracles. He said, that's not what this, with this that, time is about. With that baby, um, the that baby went on to live a normal life? Oh, yeah. Solomon's just a great, healthy, uh, grown man with oh, two wow. chil children of his own now. That's so amazing. That's so amazing. Now, uh, aside from performing miracles, Father Yod was also a practitioner of sex magic. Can you tell us about that? And was it based off of Alistair Crawley's doctrine of sex magic, or was it something else? No. Um, Alistair Crawley took the mystery school teachings of Tantra, sexual practice, and he kind of got into the dark side with it. You know, any magic, any teaching can be taken to the dark or the light. This depends on how you use it and where you yourself go, go with it. What we did is we took everything and we made it sacred. Our sex was tantric. Do you know what tantric is? Yes, um, for people that yes. aren't aware, it has to do with, isn't it like orgasm control and drawing things out, but it's also a, I believe, I want to say, is it, it's some Middle Eastern, is it Middle Eastern or Buddhist? No, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's Indian, it's Kama Sutra, it's basically, it, it, it's not a lust, a lust energy, the man actually does not lose his seed, he pulls it up his spine and it becomes an, a Kundalini experience, so, yeah, so we had, you know, we didn't have orgies, and um, it was a very sacred thing among us. And the sexual practice with the mystery school teachings is an energy to aid one to elevate themselves to a higher state of being, if it's used right. Even the, the herb that we used, which was the marijuana, we called it the sacred herb, and it was only used in the morning for meditation for spiritual purposes one hit a day, and that was it. And our music was safe, but our music was spontaneous, and um, that's just the way we that's the way we lived our life. Now, you mentioned marijuana. Was there usage of anything else, like psychedelics? No. Yeah. No. Although, most of us who came in had, you know, absolutely were, you know, came in probably using every known psychedelic there was. <laughs> <laughs> How did um, Father Yod develop his mystical doctrines? Did he come up with these on his own, or did he do study and research into them? He was well versed in spirituality before he even started the source. Are we clear? Yeah. We're clear. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he was a Vedanta monk for six months. He investigated the Quran. He knew the Kabbalah. And I mean, very well, he knew it, investigated it, lived it, studied it. American Indians, Egyptians, you name it, he went through it. And then so he brought the family through it, and we got to experience all of that. And then things started, when you're in a spiritual frequency, 
then he actually started channeling. We didn't know what that was then, but he started bringing in information in morning meditation. So we got new information, spiritual information. And we just formulated our, our life as things progressed, we progressed with it. Um, the Source family was funded, I believe, through their vegan restaurants, which you mentioned earlier. Is it true that Father Yod and the Soho family are kind of like the founders of the vegan movement? but then we, we were vegetarian because, you know, he when he, he founded the Source Western on the unknown teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and things were raw, and I guess it was pretty vegan, and it wasn't really doing that well. So he had to, uh, you know, put in cooked food and other things. But we were vegetarian. But yes, we were, we were the found, uh, he was the founders of that with the Source Restaurant. Because I yeah. think back then, there had never really been a whole vegetarian restaurant before. There had never been like this, no, no. And how long did those restaurants stay open till? Well, we sold it in in early uh, 75, late 74, and moved to Hawaii, and then the people that took it over closed it in 1994. Oh, wow. It had a very good run. Oh, wow. And people today still whine, why is it not open? <laughs> There's a lot of uh, celebrities that frequented the restaurant. It was even featured in a movie. Can you tell us about that? Annie Hall with, uh, yeah, with the Woody Allen, this famous patio scene. But it, um, it, I'm telling you, every rock star, every movie star, every producer, every mover and shaker came and ate there. So it was the place to be in the 70s and I guess the 80s and early 90s. Yeah, it, it was. I'm kind of bummed that we can't go there anymore. <laughs> now, speaking of rock stars, the family had a band called the Yahoa 13. Um, they've had a bit of a resurgence in the last few years with the internet and the documentary. Can you tell us about the band? Because it's kind of it's very different. The stuff is really good. Um, they're called, they're, they're considered cult classics, if you can find the originals. And Drag City Music actually remastered a lot of them. Um, so, they're, you know, the music is out. The guys in Yehoah 13, there was three of them. They, they tried to reform a few years ago and tour and maybe do some new stuff. And as in apparently any rock band, they, just, they were at a point where there was always that one that ruined it for the others. And so they just said, this isn't working. Whereas he's dealing with it. And so they just like all kind of walked away from it. So, well, who knows what will happen. You know, we had a lot of incredible musicians in the family. Uh, one of my, actually one of my favorite is the Savage Sons of Yehoah, which had the guys in Yehoah 13 with some of the other family musicians. But that was Father Yod's signature band. And he... Yeah, and he, he said, I'm forming this band because he said, I it will long teach after I'm gone. And that's really kind of what's been happening with those albums. Yeah, they happen and then he, yeah, yeah, and then he said, I'm done, and he handed it over to the other family musicians. And then actually when we moved, sold the source, left L.A., and moved, it's like a lot, everything just kind of stopped because we never were able to get our grounding again. They thought we were the Manson family. We were the darlings of L.A., but yeah. man, once we left L.A., it's like nobody knew who we were. No, was and they Manson, were pretty freaked out. Were the yeah. Manson family the reason that you guys left L.A.? Oh, no, 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 no. no. We left L.A. because we just, we were tired of being hassled by the housing inspectors and people were, you know, questioning why we were doing homeschooling and having home births. You know, it was illegal back then to do that oh, kind wow, of stuff. Yeah. And there was just like, you know, 150 of us living in one house, even though it was a mansion and it worked. He just wanted to get out of the city. He wanted to get our own place, grow our own food, go off the grid. Um, you know, it was a, 
a, a mindset at that time, not just with us, but with many, many people, that there was a catastrophe that was going to come. You know, the shit was going to hit the fan, is what everybody called it. And it's still, yeah, and honest, and 40 years later, it's still that same mentality. So, uh, so that's why we left. And, and Hawaii was very alluring, and we thought we would, you know, move to paradise, and it would be great. Now, you mentioned that there were 150 people living in the one big mansion, which sounds so crazy to me. Like, I can't even imagine having that many people in one house. Um, what was the, was that the most people that were ever in the Source family, or were there at one point even more members? People that were ever in the Source family, or were there at one point even more members? There were, I say 150 because that's kind of a core there were times there was more, and there was times there might have been a little less. Yeah. Okay, and so did everybody, did you guys sleep in different beds? Like, I guess you couldn't have had your own bed, but how did that work? Well, we had, we made what we called cubby holes, beehives, and they were a little, little compartments on the bottom, and on top you had another compartment. And it's like the Japanese airport now has done the same thing. They've oh, got these little compartments you can hotels. sleep in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had pods. We had pods. And they worked really good because everybody had their own space. Oh, wow. And we, we shared everything else. We only needed our own space to sleep. Uh, everything else we shared. We were communal, you know. So that, that's something, I don't think that was in the documentary at all, like, so that's something new that I'm hearing about the pods, which is kind of amazing, because that's just another really random thing that you guys kind of have evolutionized, because I don't think they even had those in Japan back then, that's more of the last like, Well, you know, it, yeah, it was in the documentary, oh, it? but it was, but it was very quick. I don't think they showed a picture of it, or, or maybe they did. Yeah, they did, but you wouldn't have known what it was. There was so much in that documentary that... Even when I watch it now, I see something different that I didn't see. Yeah, there's just so much, like, crammed into it. It was just, it was, the whole thing's so fascinating. So, you guys moved um, to Hawaii, and what happened next? Well, we just, like I said, we couldn't get a toehold in, and so we couldn't open a restaurant. Our money was kind of dwindling, and nobody would give, the, you know, the brothers a job, and... We moved back to San Francisco, then we moved back to Hawaii. Father went to India with a few people to try to see if we, maybe we could find a home somewhere else, like, you know, South America or somewhere else. And it just kind of got to the point at, at the end there where he just really realized that it was done and it was over, that he gave us everything that he meant to do. He gave us everything. And that we should all now go out and start our own path, our own journey. It came to a point, I think, in any family, or any situation where when the teacher gives you everything, there comes a point where, you, where then you should leave and, and start your own path. Did you leave or did you stay? No, nobody left. <laughs> no. I know he tried several times to say, okay, we're not doing this every, but nobody would leave, you know, and it's, so he left. That's when he went hand gliding and went off the cliff and he died nine hours later. And then that's how the family finally dispersed. Uh, it took us two years, but we did dis disperse and we all went on our own path. Are you the one that was documenting that on video in the documentary? Yes. Yes. That was a very heavy thing to watch. It was very sad. Well, no, 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 it wasn't sad. You know, that's just the problem with death. I mean, you know, it, okay, it was in a way. I mean, I, I don't miss him. We all wished he would have stayed around, but it wasn't about us. It was about him. He was done. He wanted to leave. You know, he, he, he was done. And um, we don't have the tribal teachings because we're not tribal we don't have the circle of life where everybody sees a baby being born everybody sees a person grow old they see a death nobody sees that so dying is a very scary thing people don't don't 
understand the process of dying, which we all have to do. <coughs> so. Now, you mentioned in your email when we were setting up for this interview that you're in talks with HBO. Well, we've been in talks for a few years, you know, about that. So we'll see. Okay. So you can't expound anymore on that? No, I can't. <laughs> okay, bummer. So hope, hopefully we'll get to Thank you for something. Thank you for catching on to that one. <laughs> I'm bummed out. I want to know. I want to hear something juicy, like, that you're going to be having a show. Well, or I'm, so, I'm sure if that happens or when it happens, then you know, everybody will know. Yeah, here, let me start it over. So, wow. Here, that's weird how it went out. It just, like, all of a sudden just, like, disconnected. So, Charlene, what's it like to be, or do you prefer ISIS? We, we talk now and we get to share. And I have that relationship now with her that I that I had wanted all the time. Awesome. She was growing up. Uh, now, would they ever, like, have you talked to any other members ever about getting together and buying another compound? Like, maybe... Well, we've had, no, we've had several family gatherings. Electricity did buy some land with that purpose. But it was like, oh, my God, you know, we had so much to work out when we started getting back together. It's just, buddy, you know, I don't think any of us want to live that way now. Like we want our we would like to be more maybe communal, but have our own space and be responsible for our own life. I don't think any of us particularly want to live in a house together and share. I don't know why. It just doesn't. I just, we, none of us want to do that. Now, how do you feel about the Source family being referred to as a cult? Because even though, I guess, technically it was a cult, it kind of seems unfair to call it that, because cult has no, a no, negative. Cult. You know, people think, like, the Manson family, and stuff, but you guys were the complete opposite. It's, like, brightness and love, peace. So. Well, that's part of the teachings, is to, to bring forth the right polarity of it all and cult just means culture it does not have the connotation anywhere but America that it has here and that was because of Charles Manson when the reporters and the journalists needed a hit word they that's where the word cult was born was because of Charles Manson so it had a negative connotation with everybody else and so cult is kind of a groovy thing right now if you want to know the truth a cult's being used a lot now in a very groovy way. So there's just a lot of things like that in Crone, being the elder. She's not a witch. You know, she's the last stage of the goddess trinity. There's just a lot that people need to re-understand about things, and cult is one of them. Do I don't... I, I think cult is, is very cool. Do you keep in touch with the other wives? Um, some of them, yeah. And have they all stayed as dedicated to Father Yog as you have, or is it just no. Like None of them have. Um, everybody went, you know, they married or, or did their own thing, or, you know, they, I would say none of them embraced him like I have. Like, I have stayed his wife. Everybody else went on and did other things. And, but I will say that in all of their hearts, they have that love for him. It's not like they denounced him or anything. Yeah, they just went on and did different things with their lives. So do you have anything in the works coming up in the near future? I do. I'm, I'm, I'm working on uh, what we call an art coffee table book where I can take all my archives of the photos fabulous photos of our time together and do something with them and this way give back to the family what they kind of wanted they want their you know the kids are saying some of those photos are the only ones I have of me as a child oh, wow. and uh, yeah and so um so this is the way I'm doing it yeah I'm, I'm in the process of doing that Thank you so much for granting us this interview. It's been really amazing. And I know Caitlin is too. We're both really fascinated by you and Father Yacht and the whole family. And we're always joking that we wish we could have been born in the 70s or the 60s so that we could go join the 
I really do. Like, we really, it should give them to this family. I think, you know, it, I, it, it worked for that time because it was for that time. Yeah. I think every, every generation has its time and what they're supposed to be doing within that time. And it's just, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work now for everybody. But, maybe um, I was. Maybe I well, was going to say family in the past I life. Gonna say, I know. I was going to say you. You were either born to the seed of it, or maybe you were, or it doesn't matter if you're relating to it. You're getting something out of it. Definitely. A concept. Yeah. I just I like the concept of how peaceful it was, and how everybody kind of just like coexisted. I think maybe that's what's wrong with the world. More people can be like that. Well, we did co- we coexisted because we had the glue of Father, Father Yod. When he left, it broke apart because we weren't really operating, like I said, from our intellect. We were operating from our heart, and he held that together. When he left, we kind of went back to our minds and our ego and our personalities, which is the world. That's what the world operates on. So as more people get into doing meditation, yoga, having more of a spiritual practice that takes you back to that, it'll work. And it's, it, it is actually working now. So it, it is actually working now. I hear of a lot of people that are grouping um, uh, through holistic or meditative groups. Wow. Do you know of any in specific? Or? Um, yeah, there's, there's like in Italy, there's a place called Dominure that was from the 70s. And it's an artist colony, and, and, and they're doing it. They're doing it beautifully. There's actually a lot that is still happening, but they're off the grid, so nobody knows about them, and they don't want anybody to know about them. <laughs> That's so Caitlin and I can't join. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> well, thank you. It's always, it's always fun. It's been a pleasure, and I will send this to you when it airs, but it's been an absolute okay, pleasure talking to you. Thank you.